This is what happens when a female-focused brand forgets about its targeted consumers. Victoria's Secret is the largest American lingerie retailer but is on decline. Would originally start as a brick-and-mortar lingerie retailer with one location in California's Bay Area morphed into something much bigger. Started in 1977 as a place where men could feel comfortable to buy their female significant other's lingerie, shifts in strategy have made Victoria's Secret a female-focused, faux-luxury lifestyle brand. The snobbish, high-class appeal modeled after European luxury brands combined with outstanding advertising made Victoria's Secret what it is today. Victoria's Secret catalog and annual fashion runway show have become cultural icons, launching the careers of numerous models and reshaping marketing perspectives. Yet a culture of misogyny and inattention to changing consumer preferences threatened to bring this once unstoppable force to a breaking point. Since a sales peak of nearly $8 billion in 2016, Victoria's Secret has seen its sales decline across the board. Furthermore, there have been multiple shakeups at the top of Victoria's Secret's parent company, L Brands, due to various failures of Victoria's Secret. For example, the former CEO of L Brands, Leslie Wexner, stepped down as he is embroiled in controversy for his ties to disgraced financier Jeffrey Epstein. Epstein maintained unusual ties to Leslie Wexner and is alleged to have taken advantage of his association with Victoria's Secret to find new victims. Not to mention, Chief Marketing Officer Ed Razek, the key organizer of the Victoria's Secret fashion show, made comments per perceived as insensitive to transgender and plus-size models. He'd later resigned from his position as chief marketing officer, but only after a tepid response to his apology for his comments. Additionally, Victoria's Secret was recently sold to private equity firm Sycamore Partners. The valuation attached to Victoria's Secret by the private equity firm Sycamore Partners was only $1.1 billion. A 55% majority stake in Victoria's Secret was worth just $525 million. So how did Victoria's Secret get here? Let's take a closer look on this episode of what happened to. This video will be segmented into four main parts that represent Victoria's Secret's status at that point in time. These four parts are launch, growth, peak, and decline, which will be detailed further as they're reached. Before I detail the launch of Victoria's Secret, it's important to have some context about what business environment the company operated within. For some background on the intimate apparel market, just know that leading into the 1970s, women's undergarments were in a bizarre place in American history. Men and women could either buy a three-pack of no-frills, highly functional underwear from brands like Fruit the loom, Hanes or Jockey, or they could wander into a store like Fredericks of Hollywood and find more appealing unmentionables alongside some outrageous pirate costumes and feathered boas. There's not a store where every woman or importantly an every man could buy attractive female undergarments in a tasteful pleasant setting. In steps American businessman Roy Raymond, a Stanford MBA. Raymond specifically set out to create a place where men could buy lingerie for their ladies. He was inspired by an awkward visit to a department store to buy lingerie where he felt like an intruder. Raymond borrowed $40,000 from relatives and an additional $40,000 from banks. Raymond landed on the name Victoria's Secret to illustrate the sensibility and modesty of the Victorian era, while more risque imagery lurks just below the surface. The first Victoria's Secret opened in 1977 in the Stanford Shopping Center. Center, an open-air mall on the campus of Stanford University in Palo Alto, California. This small location grossed over $500,000 in business in just its first year, funding four new store locations and a mail-order operation. Mail orders were big business throughout the 20th century of America and seen as highly desirable tools of outreach to customers living in rural areas. Americans living in rural areas made up nearly half of the population up until the 1920s. However, by the time of the launch of the Victoria's Secret catalog in the 1970s, most catalog customers did live in urban areas. In the 1970s, mail order business accounted for over one third of U.S. postal revenue. Two Chicago-based retailers, Sears and Wards, did over $3 billion and $1 billion of sales through the medium, respectively. Regardless, mail order sales weren't very profitable for either chain. Perhaps the unprofitability of mail order sales in the 1970s for Sears and Wards was an omen for the Victoria's Secret catalog, which made up the bulk of its $7 million in sales by 1982. Therefore, it should come as no surprise that Michael J. Silverstein and Neil Fisk's book Trading Up asserts that Victoria's Secret was nearing bankruptcy by 1982. The next step of Victoria's Secret's launch phase was its purchase by Leslie Wexner. Leslie Wexner was extremely successful due to his work on The Limited. His store was so called because it had a limited focus on garments like shirts, skirts, and sweaters that turned over quickly, thus generating greater revenues. He recognized that while higher priced garments had a greater per unit margin, fewer of them were sold, and he should 
should limit his focus to fast selling, mass appeal clothing that wouldn't unnecessarily clog up valuable retail space. Wexner purchased Victoria's Secret from Roy Raymond for just $1 million in 1982. Nonetheless, even Wexner's financial advisors cautioned that $1 million was too high for Victoria's Secret. Roy Raymond stayed on as Victoria's Secret's president, but the company continued to bleed money. The Limited's directors examined Victoria's Secret's numbers more closely and speculated that Victoria's Secret was only profitable because of a secondary market for mail-order sex toys. This led to Roy Raymond's firing and the moving of Victoria's Secret's headquarters to Columbus, Ohio. With Roy Raymond out and Leslie Wexner in, this is the official start of the growth phase in Victoria's Secret's life cycle. Leslie Wexner's brilliant move was to appeal to all men and women. Previously, Victoria's Secret was seeking to be a haven for men wanting to buy lingerie for significant others. Wexner closely followed the European lingerie market and desired to bring that taste to the United States. He emulated the European brand La Perla, but with a twist. La Perla is a luxury Italian lifestyle brand that originally focused on lingerie. Wexner liked La Perla's lingerie, but why Victoria's Victoria's Secret's lingerie to appear luxurious and expensive without the price tags associated with La Perla. In pursuit of that goal, Victoria's Secret stores underwent a complete redesign. The stores emphasized certain colors, styles, and patterns associated with high-class European lifestyles to attract female buyers. Additionally, the Victoria's Secret catalog continued to list its headquarters at a fake London address, despite its real headquarters being based in Columbus, Ohio. Faux luxury products of a low price caught on quickly, with Victoria's Secret becoming the largest lingerie retailer by the early 1990s. There were more than 350 locations across the United States and sales topped a whopping $1 billion. 1992 also saw the first release of a Victoria's Secret fragrance. This broke Victoria's Secret into a $2 billion fragrance market. More than 50 perfumeries were installed in Victoria's Secret stores by the end of 1992. 1995 was the year that Victoria's Secret's brand image was sealed for the better part of two decades. This was the year that Victoria's Secret started its unbelievably successful run of fashion shows. The fashion show was the brainchild of CEO Leslie Wexner and came through a series of experimentation and trial and error. The fashion show was organized by Chief Marketing Officer of L Brands, Ed Razik. Razik was responsible for hand-picking models for the show and has launched the careers of numerous supermodels including Heidi Klum, Tyra Banks, and Giselle Bunchen. By 1997, the angel had become synonymous with the Victoria's Secret brand after a particularly successful round of advertising. In 1998, the Victoria's Secret intimate apparel market share was 14%, and Victoria's Secret decides to expand into a $3.5 billion cosmetic market. One year before the turn of the millennium, the Victoria's Secret Runway Show airs for the first time online. Time describes the show as the internet-breaking moment of the era after 1.5 million viewers tune in and crash the site. Victoria's Secret delivered record profits in fiscal year 1999 and record first quarter results in 2000. In May 2000, CEO Leslie Wexner installs Sharon Jester Turney as CEO of Victoria's Secret Direct. Victoria's Secret Direct is the e-commerce and cataloging arm of Victoria's Secret. Jester Turney was previously the CEO of Neiman Marcus Direct. Wexner's purpose for installing Turney in the role of CEO of Victoria's Secret Direct was to turn around the catalog sales and breathe new life into an unfocused online presence. In addition, numerous financial analysts had pointed out the lack of market development outside of the United States. In 2000, Jester Turney redefined the Victoria's Secret catalog. She aimed to expand the customer base to include upscale clientele by designing the catalog to look more like Vogue than Playboy. The Victoria's Secret catalog was to look like a lifestyle magazine featuring cosmetics, sleepwear, lingerie and clothing throughout. By 2005, Victoria's Secret's annual fashion show had become so successful it completely redefined the concept of marketing. CBS was paying upward of $1 million a year for the TV rights to essentially what amounts to an advertisement. World-renowned musicians perform at the show while millions watch on TV. The Victoria's Secret fashion show attracted more viewers than all fashion shows combined. By 2006, Victoria's Secret was operating more than 1,000 stores in the United States, which accounted for one-third of intimate apparel purchases. In May 2006, Sharon Jester Turney was promoted from CEO of Victoria's Secret Direct to CEO of the entire company by Leslie Wexner. Jester Turney sustained double-digit revenue growth during her nine-year tenure as CEO, increasing sales by 70% to $7.7 billion between 2006 and 2016. She also doubled profit in 2015 alone. Abruptly, Jester Turney stepped down as CEO of Victoria's Secret in February 2016. Her reasoning was to focus on her family, personal life, and next step 
ups professionally. Nevertheless, departures of high-ranking executives without a clear line of succession and ample time for preparation are scary. The stock price of L Brands traded downward 5% on the day of the news. Leslie Wexner stepped in as interim CEO and made dramatic changes. There was no more Victoria's Secret catalog, no more swimwear, and apparel was only to focus on lingerie. Furthermore, the Victoria's Secret brand was split into three, Victoria's Secret Lingerie, Victoria's Secret Beauty, and Pink, with each segment headed by a different chief executive. Jan Singer, formerly CEO of Spanx Inc., took over as CEO of the Victoria's Secret Lingerie line. She had less than two years' experience as CEO at Spanx between 2014 and 2016. Perhaps former CEO Jester Turney saw something others didn't because 2016 was the first major bump in the road for Victoria's Secret. Total Victoria's Secret sales grew just 1.4% in fiscal year 2016, and direct sales, mostly online, fell 7.2% in quarter four of 2016. Victoria's Secret's share of the intimate apparel market dropped from 33% to 24% in the United States. Several competitors like Aerie, Third Love, and Lively began to take market share by focusing on body positivity and female empowerment. Victoria's Secret was late to acknowledge changing perceptions of acceptable body types in the United States, while the foundations of competitors' businesses were built around these changing perceptions. A lingerie competitor, Third Love, is noted for its half cup sizes and over 80 sizes overall, with the 60-second fit finder taken by over 12 12 million women, which replaced the outdated in-store fitting system of Victoria's Secret. Another competitor, Lively, takes on Victoria's Secret with a broader size selection, extending all the way to size 44 triple D, all at the same $35 price tag despite bigger sizes requiring more material. Victoria's Secret doesn't offer bigger than a 40 triple D and charges more for bigger bras. Even if competitors more in tune with consumer preferences didn't appear, Victoria's Secret was unable to adapt to a sensitive landscape for sexual relationships. Victoria's Secret brand Pink saw its image flounder due to over-sexualized imagery of young women during the height of the Me Too and Time's Up movements. The Victoria's Secret fashion show lost 30% of its ratings after airing just a month after the bombshell New York Times report detailing sexual abuse allegations against Harvey Weinstein. What had once been a cornerstone of sensuality in American culture became a reflection of the inequity in male-female relationships. In response to a declining brand image, Victoria's Secret resorted to heavily discounting products for short-term customer attention. Even so, Jeffrey's analyst Randall Koenig wrote in March 2018 that he believed the Victoria's Secret brand Pink was on the verge of collapse due to the level of promotions within the stores. Perhaps the comments made by longtime chief marketing officer Ed Razik in a November 2018 interview with Vogue were the final nail in the coffin for the Victoria's Secret brand image. As you may remember, Ed Razik organizes and hand-selects the models for the Victoria's Secret fashion show. In his interview with Vogue, he declared that Victoria's Secret would not feature transsexuals or plus-size models because the show was a fantasy. His comments were noted for their outdated use of the word transsexual and their lack of inclusivity. The comments were seen as transphobic and body shaming and resulted in a petition calling for Razik's firing which reached nearly 11,000 signatures. Razik formally apologized for his comments saying he was insensitive and acknowledged his desire to cast a transgender model that met Victoria's Secret's stringent standards of beauty. Less than one week after Razik's controversy, CEO of the lingerie segment Jan Singer of Victoria's Secret stepped down after just two years amidst continued Victoria's Secret sales declines. Singer previously launched bra styles that emphasize comfort and fit, but these launches were not enough to combat changing preferences in style, beauty standards, and inclusiveness among women. One month after the executive shakeup at Victoria's Secret, the fashion show brought in the lowest TV ratings ever, a mere 3.3 million viewers across America, a drop from 5 million just the year before. Two months later, Victoria's Secret parent company L Brands announced that the decision to heavily discount products dramatically decreased comparable sales the month prior. Same store sales were down 1% in January 2019 versus an increase of 4% the January before. On March 1st, 2019, 53 of the 1,143 Victoria's Secret stores were announced as closing due to a decline in performance. Same store sales dropped 3% during the holiday quarter preceding the announcement. On July 6, 2019, Jeffrey Epstein was arrested on charges of sex trafficking between 2002 and 2005, involving minors as young as 14. Epstein was a close associate of CEO of L Brands, Leslie Wexler, 
Wexner. Epstein donated over $46 million to one of Wexner's first nonprofit foundations in 2008 to maintain a close relationship. It's speculated that Epstein abused his connection with Wexner and thereby Victoria's Secret in order to facilitate crimes. Epstein allegedly told young girls he was a modeling scout for Victoria's Secret to garner trust and access to intimate encounters. It's possible Victoria's Secret executives alerted Wexner about Epstein in the 90s, but Wexner took no action. Epstein was also allowed a high degree of control over Wexner's finances. Wexner even allowed Epstein access to his mansion on East 71st Street in Manhattan. This same palatial estate is where much of the alleged abuse wrought by Epstein's Victoria's Secret influence is suspected to have occurred. Wexner immediately tried to separate himself from Epstein and decried his misfortune for being taken advantage of by someone as sick and cunning as Epstein. Nevertheless, people maintaining a degree of connection as tight as Wexner had with Epstein are viewed negatively in the court of public opinion. Wexner had high-ranking positions in Victoria's Secret since the early 80s and his Epstein connection along with Victoria's Secret's already negative brand perception cannot be overstated for the precipitation of a swift decline in sales. On August 6, 2019, over 100 models from the Models Alliance, including Mila Jovovich, penned a letter addressed to Victoria's Secret, imploring the need for protection from sexual misconduct. The letter pointed to connections between Victoria's Secret and Epstein and allegations of sexual abuse by photographers Emic, Bellamere, and Cadell. On August 15, 2019, longtime chief marketing officer Ed Razik stepped down. Razik, the fashion show organizer, made comments per Perceived as transphobic and body shaming the previous November. On November 30th, 2019, Rihanna's Fenty fashion show was a resounding success, featuring models of all ethnicities and body types. It invited immediate favorable comparisons to the cancelled Victoria's Secret show, and was applauded as superior for its inclusivity. Moreover, it was a fully choreographed performance with modeling a secondary focus to music and dance, with Rihanna herself being the headline performer. On February 20th of 2020, Victoria's Secret officially traded hands between L Brands and Sycamore Partners. The valuation of $1.1 billion meant that a 55% majority stake was worth $525 million. This number was far off from the company generating $7 billion in revenue just a few years prior. Sycamore Partners has a history of buying distressed retail brands. Victoria's Secret will be added to its collection along with the limited Hot Topic 9 West and Staples. This is not all doom and gloom for any Victoria's Secret fans out there. Sycamore Partners has seen success in reviving downtrodden and brands like Hot Topic. For instance, when Sycamore Partners purchased Hot Topic for $600 million in 2013, it only operated about 662 locations. Now it operates about 676 locations, despite a record high number of mall vacancies in the United States and Canada. Here are the key takeaways of Victoria's Secret. Victoria's Secret started as a lingerie store for men to buy their significant other's gifts, but didn't take off until it recognized the need to market to women too. At its best, Victoria's Secret products offered the appearance of luxury without the price tags to match. Its fashion shows and catalogs made it a hit in mainstream America and launched the careers of many international supermodels. However, both Wexner and Chief Marketing Officer Ed Razik deserve blame for their stubbornness in maintaining Victoria's Secret as the fantasy lingerie retailer, while consumers look for comfortable, dignified, and inclusive lingerie. Competitors offer more sizes, more convenient fitting systems, and advertise in ways that emphasize self-acceptance. Sexual abuse allegations at Victoria's Secret are the straws that broke the camel's back. The brand image of Victoria's Secret is associated with sexual exploitation, either from Epstein posing as a Victoria's Secret modeling scout, Leslie Wexner's connection with Epstein, the chief marketing officer's narrow-minded comments about beauty, or the many Victoria's Secret photographers accused of sexual abuse. Victoria's Secret needs to answer who it's products are for. Canceling the runway show in its current form may be an acknowledgement that Victoria's Secret is not marketing the right products to the right consumers and not in the right way. Once Victoria's Secret decides that it wants to sell its products to everyone in America, the possibilities are endless. It has taken the right steps by hiring models that defy its own exploitative beauty standards. Thank you for watching this episode of What Happened To.